So uh, let me uh, give you a brief uh, overview on our guests. They will introduce themselves in a second. Uh, this is uh, Lizzie Kiyama. She's founder and managing trustee at Disability Trust. Um, and she's also Shoka Fellow since uh, 2021. And she will today uh, share her story uh, with the Disability Trust. And we also have here Alex uh, De La Torre, uh, Shoka social business expert. And uh, we also have in our group Nasia Kaduramu, who is strategy consultant and social entrepreneurship expert from Africa. And I think we will have a great conversation later on in the plenary session. Uh, let me quickly introduce you to the agenda. So I will do a very short introduction on our topic, social business models. Uh, then we will have the presentation of Disability Trust by Lizzie Kiyama. Uh, we will have a plenary discussion together and then a Q&A with you, the audience, and then some uh, updates uh, on the upcoming webinars. Let me give you a brief introduction uh, of why we're meeting here. The topic today is uh, social business models uh, and funding strategies. And we're looking at this topic from the viewpoint of organizations working in disability and inclusion. So uh, which kind of business models and principles can these organizations apply to fulfill the social mission, uh, but also uh, create more financial sustainability? And I want you to give you a quick overview on the options that we're having before we starting with our keynote. The first model that many uh, social enterprises and entrepreneurs are using is the so-called integrated model. This means that if you have core activities that support specific beneficiaries, uh, as people with disabilities, for instance, uh, you have customers for these core activities and the customers can pay for your services and programs. So in this sense, business and impact model are integrated. But in many cases, your beneficiaries will not be able to pay for the services. So that means you need to go to other stakeholders related to these beneficiaries uh, and uh, ask them to pay for your services. These can be, uh, for instance, organizations uh, that also support people with disabilities, foundations, public agencies. So even there, you have an integrated model. Let's look at the next model, the hybrid one. Uh, and uh, you see on the slide two uh, circles that are crossing here. And the one circle uh, is, stands for the core activities uh, that, you, that you are really offering to your beneficiaries and they pay for that. So same as in the integrated model. But we have maybe other core activities. Let's think, for instance, about campaigns or advocacy work where you don't have customers. So in this model, uh, you're actually combining both approaches. So you have core activities in both areas. Uh, for one of them, you get direct revenue. For the others, you need to find other funding sources, let's say grants or government funding. And the hybrid model uh, lets you combine both. And the last one is the sponsorship model. So if your core activities are not generating revenue because maybe it's purely advocacy work, uh, some social enterprises are thinking about creating uh, a separate uh, for-profit entity that creates revenue and that sponsors uh, your nonprofit activities. So this is only a brief overview and the, the challenges for each organization to find the right model that fits with its uh, vision uh, and mission. Uh, and uh, I'm happy also to, uh, I'm happy also to introduce uh, now actually uh, our speaker, Lizzie Kiyama, who will give us the a perspective on social business models uh, from her experience with Disability Trust, uh, which is an organization that uh, supports uh, women with disability in Kenya. Uh, and I'm closing uh, my presentation now. And I would like to hand over uh, to Lizzie uh, Kiyama. I will bring her uh, on the stage with me. So hi, Lizzie. Are you with us? As you cannot unmute, I will make you co-host. Now you can unmute and uh, open your video. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you, um, Alex. Sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself. 
for the longest time. Um, uh, so, Lizzie, over to you. Please start with a short visual self description and then introduce yourself, and then the floor is yours. Great. Um, so my visual description, I am an African woman, so I am I have brown skin. I have um, braids um, on my hair, um, silver braids actually, and I have a grayish sweater on. I am also wearing um, black rimmed um, spectacles and I have a septum, a gold septum ring on my nose. So this is who I am. I identify as a disabled woman. Um, I, I have a mobility um, impairment and I use a wheelchair, which you cannot see, of course, but I also use walking aids um, if that is useful. So I'll go into my um, other description, I guess. Um, as Alex uh, graciously introduced, my name is Lizzie, Lizzie Kiyama, and I am the founder and managing trustee at Disability Trust. We are a nonprofit organization um, that focuses on the sexual reproductive rights of women and girls with disabilities in Kenya. And um, most recently, I, I became an Ashoka Fellow. I believe the process started in, in 2020 and was concluded um, last year in 2021. And it has been um, an interesting ride for, for me and my team. Um, Alex started with talking about the different models of um, social enterprises. And it's interesting because for me, I started with the, with the last model, I started as a for-profit um, because I wanted to, my background is in business and my background is with private sector. That, that is the, um, I have spent a, a number of years in, in private sector before coming into the nonprofit world. So that was my go-to. That was the only thing that I knew. So I registered, I knew I wanted to, to work on disability because I, as a disabled woman, I did not see enough women with disabilities um, interacting, um, exercising their rights. And then when I became a mother, I experienced quite a bit of challenges with the healthcare system. So I said I might be able to, you know, contribute to, you know, the change that I would like to see. And so I registered a company because, again, that is what I knew. And at the time when I was registering, it was extremely challenging because the idea of working on disability, which is traditionally considered an, a, a charity at the time, it was really a charity um, approach when it comes to disability rights. And pairing that with a business model was a conflict. And um, even at the registration, the government registration process, there was a, a lot of pushback. Um, and, and we had to get creative with how we, um, the language that we used because they did not want to see disability there because the two, according to them, could not exist um, in, in the same space. But anyway, first, first forward, I um, was able to, to do quite a bit of work from a consultancy standpoint that was then able to give me the resources, the flexible resources that I felt I needed to work on the issues um, amongst communities of women with disabilities in Kenya. And for me, that flexibility was extremely important because it allowed me to make mistakes. And from what we know about the nonprofit um, environment, there's not much appetite for risk taking. So for me, because this was an, a new area, um, I needed to be able to make mistakes um, without, you know, somebody looking over my shoulder, you know, without needing to prepare reports and, and all that. So I did that from uh, 2013 to 2018. And interestingly, the people that were providing me with consultancies were, you know, traditional donors that wanted to learn about the disability space and wanted to test out you know, um, a few theories, but they did not necessarily have specific funding for, for disability. So it worked out um, for both of us. But then after the five years of, of doing this work, the same donors came back and said, okay, you, it would be good for you to go deeper into the community and think about possibly a nonprofit model that, you know, would allow you to build a team and, and focus on a specific thematic area. And in 20, um, 
18, this is what um, um, we decided to do and we became a trust. Our area of work has always been sexual reproductive rights, mainly because of this is as a disabled African woman, this was my reality. Um, it was something that I could speak to, my experience and the, the, the changes in society that I wanted to see was something very close you know, to me. So I, in my experience with all the consultancies that I had been doing with communities of women with disabilities was the experience of each and every woman. You know, the stigma in the healthcare settings, the discrimination, the inaccessibility, um, the lack of investments, um, the lack of, you know, employment opportunities, the inaccessible transport to, you know, to be able to um, exercise your rights in a, in a dignified manner. All that we were able then to package um, as the trust. And um, in 2020, when the pandemic began, um, we were then able to, we had always been, been, been trying to preach the idea of using technology. And if you, if you work in the disability rights um, space, you know that organizations for persons with disabilities have always advocated for technology because of the accessibility that technology provides. And, you know, we had been trying to do this, but of course, there's limited um, resource, financial resources when it comes to disability and even less um, risk taking in, in the sector. So the idea of, you know, using technology to provide services to communities um, of women with disabilities was always met with resistance. But when the pandemic happened and everyone was using technology to, um, to function, to have meetings, to work, to um, maintain proximity um, with their clients, with their customers, to ensure that you know, project participants or partners were still benefiting from, from information or services, it was important now. Technology presented this huge opportunity. And of course, we, we had all these concepts that we had written that had been turned down before that we now were saying, okay, we are ready, can you um, give us the resources to test this idea? And we were able to move all our programs. We have three main programs that allow persons with disabilities to register themselves on you know, a basic um, mobile phone, so not smartphone related. And we know, for example, in Kenya, that at least 98%, um, we have a 98% mobile penetration rate across Kenyan households. So we, we were then able to ensure that we can reach as many people as possible. This platform now has over 20,000 people registered. We then um, created, uh, moved all our capacity building programs online. So we have an e-learning platform where women with disabilities can interact with the causes and, you know, um, it allows us to increase our impact in terms of providing um, advocacy skills um, and different, you know, skill building courses online. Of course, that is paired with an app, so you can also use your mobile to access these courses. And the interesting thing with that, we have been able to develop a course that trains healthcare workers on the sexual reproductive rights of women with disabilities. So dealing with that stigma, dealing with that um, discrimination that women with disabilities have continuously um, experienced. And then the heart of all our work is um, our Mama Siri um, platform, which is a toll-free service that is coordinated by women with disabilities in eight counties. And um, it allows us to respond to issues on uh, gender-based violence. It allows us to respond to issues around sexual reproductive rights. And it allows us to build a community of service providers who understand our work. Those service providers include the police, include um, legal aid clinics. So it's a comprehensive holistic um, program that would have not been possible um, had the pandemic not happened because you know, the priority around leveraging technology was not um, available then. Um, as I said in the beginning, um, my background is, is in business. And um, Alex mentioned, you know, the different principles that social, um, social organizations, social enterprises um, take. 
So for us, because we work on sexual reproductive rights, we have always looked at the principles of marketing because when it comes to um, sexual reproductive rights, our policies um, traditionally in Kenya have not necessarily included um, intention to ensure women, the rights of women with disabilities are addressed. So the, our policies are silent when it comes to how women with disabilities would access, you know, reproductive um, rights. Um, additionally, when it comes to, because our policies are silent, uh, the programming, um, when organizations are thinking about uh, reproductive health programming, um, again, there's very little visibility in terms of how women with disabilities would access um, these programs. So it means that issues around um, accessibility, whether it is uh, how they access this information, you know, women who are blind, women who are deaf, you know, how do we allocate uh, budgets that can ensure sign language interpretation? How do we ensure that because this is a reproductive health program that, you know, we are, we are providing um, confidentiality and privacy across you know, the healthcare system? How do we strengthen um, our healthcare systems, our healthcare workers to ensure that they begin to unlearn um, um, the, the negative perceptions when it comes to disability? Because a lot of the time that is the biggest barrier. So we, are, we, look, we look at marketing, the principles of marketing from an extremely um, holistic standpoint. How do we ensure that healthcare uh, centers in, in rural areas, are, women with disabilities can access them, that they are not far, you know, um, they're normally far, few and far, you know, between. So it's extremely important that for us, we begin now interrogating um, county government uh, policies and, and, and speak to the, the reality of women with disabilities that this does not work because if you're disabled and you have to travel 50 kilometers, for example, to the closest healthcare setting, um, it means that you have to pay for private transport. And if you don't have a way to generate income, then it's an additional burden for you. Most of the time, if you're disabled, you need to travel with, with an assistant. And that means an additional cost on you. If you have a mobility aid, say like a wheelchair, that's another cost on you. So all these systems um, have to, we have to have this consideration. And we find that county governments do not know. Like there is no entry point at any stage where we are upskilling government um, officials around disability. They don't know what they don't know. And so we found this gap and we, um, we thought from a marketing standpoint, it adds value for us to build these um, partnerships with county governments and also the healthcare workers. So we have a pretty um, interesting um, intervention that allows us to touch each uh, pain point, if you will. And then from an advertising standpoint, um, how the media perceives women with disabilities is extremely critical because media is an extremely powerful tool in terms of public awareness. And if we don't begin to change the narrative around disability, then the public continues to see women with disabilities as victims, as children, as um, individuals that do not have inherent you know, human rights. And that's a problem because that's how they perceive women with disabilities then informs how they plan for women with disabilities or how they continue to um, ensure that women with disabilities are invisible. So if we do not change how media sees women with disabilities, um, we really are not doing anything. And from a sexual reproductive standpoint, women with disabilities are sexual beings. And that has, a, has an interesting um, connotation when it comes to media. We are never seen as sexual beings. So that has been our entry point in terms of the principles of um, marketing and, um, and, and advertising. And it has served us well. We have had campaigns where we actually get um, people on social media, Kenyans on social media, having difficult conversations because they then interact with their internal bias um, and, and, and realize that, you know, because we do not plan, how then do we expect these women who might have specific um, 
might experience barriers because we have not thought about it. So if anything, our campaigns, we do a lot of social media campaigns. We use a lot of billboards, you know, alternative forms of media to get the point, the, the point across. And it has, you know, it has served our work. Sometimes we get pushback, but the pushback is also necessary because it gets um, people talking. So in a nutshell, I think I, as, as somebody who has done this work and who has explored the different models, um, it's an extremely interesting space to be in. There's a lot of um, path towards um, social entrepreneurship. There isn't, at least not from where I stand. Um, there has been, you know, highs and lows. There has been um, need to reevaluate, to change strategy. Um, for me, I have felt that flexibility is extremely important. You cannot be stuck on, you know, this is the only way to do things. Be clear on the vision. My vision has always been advancing the rights of women with disabilities. How we achieve this vision is always flexible. Because today I will meet somebody who's telling me, um, okay, we might provide you funding, but um, how we see women with disabilities is from a victim standpoint. And then there's good money and bad money as well. And you have to be, for me, it's important to be in a place that um, can say, okay, this doesn't work for me. And maybe in order to get to a place that we can work together, we need to build your skills around disability. We, because I will not be working with someone who refers to women with disabilities as victims because that change needs to happen, you know, in, internally from both the, the, the partner's um, standpoint and, you know, the external um, uh, society standpoint. So I think it's, it's important to be in a good place. And I think for me, we, we are in a good place because of how we started and, and, you know, being able to generate income on our terms. And then now finding, you know, donors that understand who we are because we know who we are and the values that we stand for. And then now finding like-minded partners and them coming into a system that is working and them coming in to support and strengthen that system. And not necessarily the other way that we are desperate for the money and that we will do anything to get the money. And I think because disability is a, is a topic or is an issue, uh, is a cultural issue, particularly in Africa, how we are socialized around disability is problematic from the very beginning. So if we, if we can understand that everyone, myself included as a disabled woman, we have internalized stigma around disability. Everyone needs to unlearn what we know about disability. Everyone has bias towards disability. Then investing in that unlearning needs to happen on both fronts and that we're all learning. It is not just because you're bringing money then I can tell you what to do. No, I can also tell you what to do because you don't know and we're all in this together. So all this to say that it's been an exciting ride. Um, I'm still enjoying it. We right now we are thinking about kind of separating um, our processes in terms of um, our sustainability because we 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 have gotten to a place where now we can transfer ownership to the community and we can have I'm not sure which one it was I think it was the integrated where services are transferred to 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 the community and they can um you know pay for the services of course uh you know from we're going to test this out from a very minimal standpoint but just to begin planting the idea that the they need to the community needs to ensure that whatever it is is adding value to them that it is not only donor driven so if we can sustain it within the community then we're good to go Alex, am I done? Is my term time over? Because I could go Thanks. on and on. Yes, yes, yes. And no, no, I'm just, just taking also the spotlight because uh, thank you so much, Lizzie, for giving you, for, for giving us this insight into your story uh, and also how you apply business principles in your work. Uh, we would now like to uh, start the plenary discussion. And I would like to uh, welcome to the stage uh, also my colleague, Alex De La Torre, a business expert from Ashoka. Uh, as well as uh, Nasir Kadurama, um, 
a colleague and social entrepreneurship expert and social business expert from Africa. So we'll also add him to the spotlight. Welcome. So it was very important for us to have, you know, a, a diversity of experts also in the room to discuss a bit uh, the topic of social business models. Um, I would maybe uh, like to, to kick it off with uh, you, Nasir, and please provide a quick intro on yourself, also visual description. Uh, but the question for you would be, um, what opportunities and challenges do you, you see for social businesses and a social uh, business approach in the African context? Maybe you can uh, provide us a little intro on that, but please, before that, introduce yourself. Over to you, Nasia. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here and uh, good to engage with all of you. Nasia Katuramo is my name. I'm Ugandan. Uh, description of myself, I am 5'10 uh, in height. I am about 70 kilograms heavy. Um, I have brown skin, brown eyes, very short hair. I have some gray hair on my beard over here. You can you know, you struggle to see it. Um, yeah, so I think that that does it for my visual description. I've been working in the social entrepreneurship space now for about 17 or so years. With the Shoka and with other organizations, I primarily work with social enterprises, um, non-profit um, organizations um, around the topic of social enterprise uh, impact and uh, strategy development. Um, so I hope that that experience will uh, enable me to share some insights on this topic and uh, others that we'll be discussing today. So the question was, what opportunities, uh, what opportunities exist for social enterprise and what challenges are involved? Um, I personally am of the view that social enterprise is probably the most sustainable approach to solving the problems that we have around us. Um, have absolutely nothing against the traditional nonprofit approach, but I think the times are such that you absolutely need to figure out a way to be independently sustainable. And there is nothing to stop traditional nonprofits from doing it. And uh, becoming a social enterprise doesn't in any way get in the way of. Um, delivering on the impact objectives of, uh, of uh, what would otherwise be a traditional nonprofit. So I think the opportunity um, really lies in the potential that social enterprise presents to, um, uh, to impact-driven organizations. I think through a social enterprise model, you're able to scale faster. Um, you will be uh, uh, faced with uh, much, uh, shall I say, uh, the risk uh, of not having funds and uh, you know sleeping, uh, worry, being unable to sleep at night because you're worried about whether or not you're going to have the funding you need to sustain your projects from one year to the next. Um, there's just so many advantages to being a social enterprise and running a social enterprise model that you will not find in your traditional nonprofit way of of work. Um, um, and also, there are just so many problems to solve around us everywhere you turn. Uh, this is certainly in the context of Africa. Um, there's just so much room to innovate and so much room to, um, to come up with new ideas and, and solve problems in a way that really uh, perceives the beneficiary as a customer. So I really like uh, the note that you ended on, Lizzie, which was to say, you know, if you're able to uh, implement an integrated model where the product and service that is actually your vehicle for delivering impact is in itself a product that can be paid for by the would-be beneficiaries. I think uh, being able to deliver uh, on a model like that really does present many, many opportunities. Um, of course, it doesn't come without challenges. Social enterprise requires a new way of thinking. Um, you have to wear two hats. Um, you have to be able to think about your beneficiary group, quote unquote, um, your user group, um, that should be the beneficiaries of the work that you're doing in a slightly different way um, from your customers who you have to be able to deliver uh, value for money. Uh, you have to think about marketing and sales in a way that sometimes can be uncomfortable um, if you're somebody who's used to engaging in a nonprofit environment. Um, the way you make decisions, the way that you account uh, for uh, uh, the, 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 the finances that you have in the organization, the focus on making money rather than spending it. 
um, there's just there's a culture shift that needs to happen and a mindset shift that needs to happen. Um, and so it is challenging. Um, you often have to have um, uh, a complex web of skills within the organization um, with some individuals focused on delivering impact and everything that takes while others really focusing on product development, marketing, sales, and revenue generation. And so it can be a very complex um, uh, um, effort. And so it is challenging, but it's doable. And there are many, many examples of how it can be done. And it is something that would be worth your while um, if you can put in the effort and energy to figure out some of these challenges. Thank you, Nasir, for kicking us off with, with this answer. I would like to hand over uh, also to my colleague, uh, Alex Della Torre, who worked with many Ashoka Fellows and social enterprises on developing social business models for them. And maybe you can also add to Nasi's perspective, you know, what, what were the challenges that you observed in your work? But before doing that, I would also ask you for a quick self-introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, with pleasure. So um, I'm Alex de la Torre, a European male, uh, white skin, brown hair, and brown beard, a, a bit of a small beard because I clean shaved for November this month. Uh, and I'm wearing a gray sweater, so I feel I'm part of, of, of Lizzie's team as well. Um, and yeah, I've been with Ashoka for over four years. Uh, before I was working as an economic consultant uh, for around seven years. And my role at Ashoka has been focused on supporting social entrepreneurs in launching business models and raising social finance through our uh, accelerator programs, courses, and workshops. I had the opportunity to work with Nasir several times uh, in accelerator programs in Africa. And yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, with, uh, with Nasir, and, and it was great to have uh, Lizzie's case uh, like that, that she explained so well. I, 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 I do see, I mean, I had a lot of experience in, in, in that phase of launching a social business model, which takes a lot of time and effort in the beginning. Um, so that for sure is something that uh, a social entrepreneur organization should take into account before starting this process. But it is uh, very true, as Nasir was saying, that it is a, uh, a way of, uh, not, not always, but very often, to be able to scale up more, more quickly and, and to contribute uh, very significantly to the financial stability of the organization. So uh, you are untapping a new source, which is your revenue generating activities, uh, but you even have the possibility to raise investment in the form of debt, uh, like small loans, for instance, or even for, for high growth uh, models, of course, you can also raise uh, equity. Uh, if that if that makes sense, um, and and all that with the possibility of keeping uh, the the grant making activities, so playing with two roles, right, and 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 having this hybrid structure. And at Ashoka, we've had so many examples from uh, our Ashoka fellows, leading social entrepreneurs who decided to launch the social business model, keeping the uh, nonprofit organization. Um, it requires, of course, like the, I mean, you need the, the skills to be able to play with the, with the two hats, but it's, it's a very effective way to be able to like talk to different type of funders. Um, and, and you probably will keep needing some, some grants for some part of your activities. So that's why we always recommend to, to be able to uh, differentiate between the generated revenue generating activities and other activities that might, might need uh, grant funding to, to, to keep happening. Um, and it's about applying this flexibility, always serving the mission uh, and with the idea to achieve more impact. So, so yeah, I mean, that the challenge is the time, but, but the opportunity is huge. Uh, the, in, in Africa with Nasir, we've been seeing how the number of impact funds uh, looking for social businesses in Africa is, is increasing. And, and they always look for this element of uh, scalability. And, and their models that have the technology component uh, are, are really, really a, 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 in a very good position to attract this funding from, from, uh, from impact funds. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex, also for sharing this perspective on what it means for fundraising and also getting investments. 
I would like to go back to you, Lizzie. I would be interested in seeing how does this transition to incorporate you know, business principles, models, how does this transition look from the inside? So which challenges did you really perceive in your organization with your teams? So maybe you can give us a little insight on that. Was it challenging uh, for you? Uh, um, I, I guess um, our, so internally, when, we, when you come up with concepts, for example, for donors, um, making the link between marketing, the need for you know, uh, business principles such as marketing and advertising, and making that link between what we want to see from a human rights standpoint, that has been the challenge. Um, Ensure because donors come in from uh, okay uh, most of the most of the donors that um, work on disability rights the ones that I have interacted with come from a purely human rights standpoint so again to say that this is when we focus on media and when the chosen media is 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 billboard advertising, for example, because we want to shift the narrative and because when we shift the narrative, this is what we are looking, this is the outcome. And this is how it then contributes to women with disabilities, sexual reproductive rights. It's not an internal issue that we necessarily dealt with, but an external ensuring that the donor understood that link, that it was not your typical concept, right? That it was, it was, pushing boundaries even within the set systems in the nonprofit world. So that has been um, the challenge. But because um, we did not start out as a traditional nonprofit, I think the, and that's why we have very few donors, <laughs> the ones who get it and, and the ones who are willing to trust us, um, it's not necessarily been such a difficult thing. Although when we get backlash, when it comes to, because advertising can go either way, right? Um, and and from, an, from an advertising standpoint, you say, you know, um, there's nothing like bad publicity. But in the nonprofit world, you don't want bad publicity. The first thing that donors will do is do, you know, any due diligence. And if there's any negative connotation with the work that you do, you know, they're risk averse. So they, they, they step away. So for us, for me, uh, ensuring that my team understands why it is that we do this and anticipate that this can go either way. And if it goes either, what does either way look like? If we get backlash, what does that mean? It's because people are engaging with the content. And that's a good thing because issues around women with disabilities are normally silent. So we, we do want people to talk. Whatever it is that they're talking about, it's a good thing. People are talking. And that means our issues are not swept under the rug. So that comfort with the uncomfortable internally has been um, a little interesting. Okay, yeah. thanks so much for sharing. I would also give the stage to our audience to ask questions that we can discuss in this plenary and that we can answer. Um, maybe uh, share it in the chat, that would be great. Um, so you can share it now. I'm sure you have some questions. Uh, could also be questions to to a specific plenary participant or to all of us. Maybe I give you a bit of time. There is one question from Connie. Thanks so much. Um, to Lizzie, uh, are the, there employment trainings that you have in any of the organizations? Has Lizzie on a CIA worked with organizations that do micro loans? Uh, yeah. That, that are based on microloans and was this successful? So actually two question in one. So employment trainings and microloans. Maybe Lizzie, did you work with these instruments? So, so we've so when you say employment trainings, like um, so we do a lot of diversity and inclusion trainings for you know employees of, of different organizations that we do. But um, from a micro um, loan standpoint, we have worked, tried to work with financial institutions, um, again, to um, get them thinking about uh, micro products for women with disabilities. But again, financial institutions, at least uh, in Kenya, or maybe the ones that I was dealing with, the, the risk appetite was not there because they did not necessarily um, have relationships with, with, with these women and they could not establish their credit history. 
there was, you know, a, a risk around that. Um, it's something that we want to work, begin working on um, actively next year. So hopefully I can share more about that then, but yeah. Okay, hey, thanks so much. Uh, maybe the audience has another question. Or maybe Nasir sure that... wants to respond. Or yeah, maybe yeah, make no, a time. Yeah, Nasir. Yes, no, I can certainly add to this. Um, so um, I've seen this concept work in the context of uh, micro business financing. So, you know, if you're talking about employment in the context of small businesses or small income generating activities, particularly targeted at low income communities, then certainly the idea of micro loans to enable the launch of small businesses as a driver for employment creation, I've seen this work for sure. Um, however, it is something that has to be seen as risk capital that's being given to the small uh, micro loans, and it has to come along with a lot of handholding and support and mentorship um, to the small business owners. So it is not business as usual, um, which is simply a matter of providing the loan um, to a small business owner um, and then sitting back and expecting that that loan is going to be paid back. It takes a lot more investment and, and, uh, and energy um, uh, being put into mentorship and uh, business coaching to ensure that these businesses are being well managed, to ensure that uh, revenue is being um, utilized and allocated uh, correctly in order to increase the chances that it's paid back. So where you have that finance plus uh, approach, um, as they call it, um, it has worked uh, very successfully. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we're translating one Spanish question. We will ask them in a second. Uh, we have another question in the meantime from Pramod. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, he's saying that our project is so much uh, of a need to what government is supposed to be doing and therefore adding a lot of value to improve the efficiency. But the process and accessing funds from government in India for social projects like ours is not easy. So what are the experience maybe in the African context to really access government funding for what you're doing? I'm not sure who wants to take it. <laughs> um, I can go. Um, we, we have tried to partner with government um, uh, recently be because it's the same thing. The services that we offer really should be government led. And, and the idea is that government absorbs some of these programs um, but they don't have the capacity and they do not want to admit that they have the, they don't have the capacity. So we've tried to sell the idea that we can do this, you know, through you, you take ownership in the, in, in the, in, in the work, but, um, getting government resources has also been challenging for me. So I would love to hear if anyone else has been successful. Um, it has been a long and tedious process. In Kenya, I just have to say, in Kenya, we have a national government and then we have you know, 47 devolved county governments. And now our approach, because we work in eight counties, is to build direct you know, relationships with the county governments. And there seems to be a lot more willingness and openness for them to tackle disability issues. But with the national government, when we tried it, you know, we had roadblocks um, every step of the way. So I, I'm seeing a little bit of um, traction with the county government. So maybe if you, there's a lowered um, local administrative um, process, maybe that's one way that you can look at it as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Maybe there's a more general question that I can ask to the whole group. Uh, that's uh, the question we translated from uh, Spanish. I would like, uh, Gwendolyn would like to know or would like you to share key recommendations uh, for achieving sustainability of so social businesses. So maybe from, from your experience, uh, maybe uh, Alex uh, or Nasia, do you want to start it off, Alex? Yeah, uh, very happy to do so. Well, um, an easy answer like it, it of course it depends on having a good product or service as any other type of business but <clears throat> you have to leverage off the fact that you're serving a mission right so um all your marketing and communication efforts should be able to to communicate that very well um so when offering these product or service uh to to your customers you're also uh, you also need to emphasize how they are tackling this specific social issue that you are uh, that is part of your mission. Um, 
so that's one thing and 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 of course uh starting a social business from from a non-profit uh, organization uh it does take time and and it has to, has to be set up uh, in the proper way for this my uh big recommendation is mm, try to get experts legal and finance experts and country specific because these kind of uh legal structures require uh like country specific knowledge um and the, the good thing about being a social organization is that you may get pro bono or low bono support in this sense so try try your best to to make a good use of, of these opportunities thanks so much would you like to add nothing yes i just one one point which is um you know in the non-profit world uh the default thinking is usually that the target group cannot afford whatever services or products that we are delivering or providing. And I think that's a wrong mentality. Uh, so the first step in becoming more sustainable and really moving towards this social enterprise model of engaging is to just challenge yourself and your stakeholders and say, look, is it possible for whomever it is that we are serving to pay, even if it's just a little bit for whatever it is that you're delivering? That's really where it starts. And you'll be surprised. Um, you know, you'll go out and you'll talk to your beneficiaries, and they may not be able to pay a market rate for whatever it is that you're delivering. But even if they can cover 10% of the cost, uh, you know, 10, 5, 15% of the cost, that already is a step in the direction of uh, more sustainability for the organization. So this is something I thought I should mention because it is often overlooked and uh, it does require a bit of boldness and just you know, giving yourself as a nonprofit the freedom to go out there and just try it out. Uh, you have nothing to lose. And uh, you'll be quite surprised uh, with the results that you find. Thank you. We have another question from Jazar, which is uh, really interesting. So for receiving more long-term per permanent funding, how important is it to measure impact, measure results? And what are your experiences in this regard? So maybe I, I give this to, to Lizzie. How important is impact measurement for you at the moment? Uh, to really attract mid and long term funding? I think uh, for me now, 10 years later, it's extremely important. But when I began, it wasn't um, because what was the, the value? Um, what was the measure of, of impact? Um, I'm working with um, about 40 women with disabilities um, and it is extremely superficial, the intervention that I'm providing. Um, it is project-based. Um, funding is provided for workshops that are at most a week long. No tangible value that I felt I was offering the, the community. So what we decided to do was keep working with the same groups of women, the same groups of women throughout the entire period so that we can truly be able to measure from a holistic standpoint. So when we get funding and the donor is specific that they want us to deal with family planning, it's the same women that I trained on legal frameworks, um, you know, that I am also offering a training on, on family planning. It is the same women that I have taken with me over the 10 years. So now that I'm thinking about, you know, um, uh, what do you call it, um, a, a, a customer type model where these women will be paying a small fee, it is because I know that, you know, they can do it. So the entire conversation about businesses knowing your customer, I think it still applies for nonprofits as well. It's extremely important, but the system does not allow us to truly know our customer because it's super sporadic, very ad hoc funding that does not allow us to, to think from a holistic standpoint. So I just made it work for me. Um, and now that we were able to scale and we serve direct, serve 400 women. And our one of our platforms has, as I said, over 20,000 people registered, but we still work with the 400 because that is what makes sense. Um, I am now able to look at program A and you know think about analyzing all the data that we have received over the years 
and apply lessons and you know even make policy recommendations because I have the evidence. But it's extremely difficult to ask people to measure impact. Impact for who? You know, not to the community. Doesn't you know? So it's an extremely difficult, um, and it is how the system is. So I would say you have to get creative in what impact means because uh, it really should not be, yeah, maybe I should not say this, but I don't think it should be donor driven. I think the funding that we receive from donors is a partnership and we need to know the value that we bring on the table and that we also need to be able to push back on some of the systems that are there. So if it doesn't work for you, push back and, and suggest how else it can be done. So, sorry, Alex. That's 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 a great uh, last word and statement uh, that we also can be self-conscious of the value we bring to social systems and to our communities, also towards donors and government agencies, etc. Uh, thanks so much uh, for this session. We are at the end of the public webinar. Um, so thanks so much for Lizzy for your great keynote and your contribution here. Uh, thanks to Alex de la Torre and Nasia for coming in and having this conversation with us. And of course, uh, thanks uh, for the audience uh, to, to be here with us. Uh, I would like to share one last slide uh, on the upcoming webinars. Um, so this has been the second webinar uh, on social business models. We had the first one on impact. You will get uh, the recordings uh, on the web page you see below, and this will also be part of the follow-up mail uh, we will be sending shortly after this webinar tomorrow. Uh, upcoming is uh, the third public webinar on global scaling strategies. So this will be really about the topic of how to scale social impact also across borders. We want to have a uh, social enterprise from India uh, or uh, from Latin America with us there. It's a really kind of an international um, approach to what we're doing. And then uh, the fourth webinar on 18th of uh, January will be about uh, pitching, but in a very holistic way. So how to use speech and body to get your message across. Uh, thanks so much uh, for joining today. Um, thanks also to Sumita for uh, supporting us with the, with the chat. And also, of course, she's a big contributor to the whole program and also our interpreters, uh, Leslie and Diana. Thanks so much for being here and have a good day. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.